Good morning, everyone. Uh, Dr. Ozalga, Errol Ozalga couldn't be here today, so I'm going to be kicking us off this morning. We just have to, a few announcements before um, our speaker. So I'll pass it on to our Associate Chair for Diversity, Dr. Dunn. Go ahead, Dr. Dunn. And Christine, if you could show the slide, please. Thanks so much, Dr. Harmon. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to this wonderful Grand Rounds. Um, just a few announcements of some upcoming events. Um, please save the date for our discussion of Nicole Hannah Jones's 1619 Project, Episode 2. That is Nicole Hannah Jones's groundbreaking work um, that examines our democracy. Um, looking through the lens of um, slavery and how it shaped our democracy. We'll be discussing the second episode, which is called The Economy That Slavery Built on May 31st from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. That will be a virtual event and we hope to see you all there. We'll stick the registration link in the chat. Dr. Salas and I will be leading a discussion. And next slide, please. And I also wanted to let you know about some upcoming Health Equity Action Leadership or LEAD lectures. There's the Asian Health Equity Across the Lifespan lecture, um, where Anne Singh, Robert Huang, and Joshen Profit will be um, in a discussion moderated by Bryant Lin. That is next Tuesday, May 17th from 12 to 1. And then there's the Building a Culture of Health Equity Summit lecture series. Um, that will be happening on May 19th from 8 to 2 p.m. And then finally, there's a health equity research in the LGBTQ plus community um, lecture um, June 28th from 12 to 1. And that will be moderated by Leslie Subak. We'll tell you more about that as it nears. You can find information about any of these lectures on the OFDD website. Thanks so much. And I'll pass it back to Dr. Harmon. Great. Thanks. There's the next slide. So uh, what you'll see in front of you is a, uh, an update from our um, colleagues in the Employee Resource Group with Stanford Healthcare um, for the Asian American and Pacific Islander Month events. Uh, you can scan those QR codes to, uh, to register for different events throughout the month. Um, those also include the registrations for um, several of the events that Dr. Dunn has mentioned, and we'll put those links also in the chat as well. Next slide. Okay, so uh, I wanted to mention a brief update. Dr. Bowman could not be with us um, this morning, but was able to send this most recent update on um, kind of employee infections in terms of COVID and just wanting to draw your attention um, to a very clear spike that we've had recently. I know we uh, mentioned this in prior um, Grand Rounds uh, earlier this month, but to note that last week has been the highest number um, since um, kind of the January period. We're at 278 um, and to really kind of take, um, take note and pause thinking about kind of risk adjustments you may be making. We'll have more updates next week. Next slide. Upcoming Grand Rounds um, to, to draw your attention to. Next week, we'll have Dr. Amy Abernethy from uh, Verily, who will be speaking on envisioning the future of evidence generation for precision health. The following week, we'll have Dr. Anekwe Onwani, um, who is a professor of medicine, chief of cardiology at Morehouse, speaking on health equity and design of heart failure management um, programs for safety in hospitals. And then Dr. Jay Sevelius, um, who will be speaking to us from the University of California, San Francisco. And with that, uh, I would like to introduce our speaker this morning. It is my distinct pleasure to be introducing Dr. Fumiko Chino as our Grand Round speaker. Dr. Chino is an assistant professor and attending at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center with a clinical fo focus on the treatment of gynecologic and breast cancers and radiation oncology. Um, and actually prior to medicine, Dr. Chino had had a career in video art and production. Uh, and I know she'll say more about this um, as she uh, presents um, uh, her presentation. But her research focuses on the financial toxicity of cancer care, cost effectiveness, and radiation utilization rates and patient reported outcomes. 
She's won multiple awards from the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, American Society of Therapeutic um, Radiation Oncology, or ASTRO, and the American Society of Clinical Oncology, where she was recently awarded the 2022 ASCO Excellence in Equity Award, uh, which honors an ASCO member who has made significant contributions to diversity, equity, and inclusion in the field of oncology and increased access to equ equitable care for cancer patients. Dr. Chino will be speaking to us today on the financial toxicity and cancer in America. Without further ado, Dr. Chino. Thank you so much for that really kind introduction. I am going to share my screen very, um, hopefully successfully. Um, I was honestly very thrilled to get the invitation to speak today. Um, I'm really happy to share this topic about financial toxicity. And although my research has been focused specifically within cancer, I always um, want to highlight the fact that financial toxicity exists in many other disease um, sites. And um, it is unfortunately something that's really growing. Um, I have no relevant financial disclosures for this talk. I do typically start my talk for anything involving financial toxicity with this survey. Um, so ASCO is the American Society for Clinical Oncology and they do a national opinion survey. Um, this particular survey found that there was actually slightly more people who were worried about the financial burden of a cancer diagnosis than from dying of cancer. Um, and what we know is that um, these financial burdens are really causing significant um, problems for our patients and that there, it's not just, for example, health insurance, but there are also, again, real sacrifices that patients are making. Um, in the most updated ASCO survey, what they found was that patients are having anxiety related to a cancer diagnosis specifically about that financial burden, and that affordability is a concern. It's not a concern for every single person. However, um, there are people who are really honestly quite scared at a cancer diagnosis. The first question is not, will I survive it, but how am I going to pay for it? Um, we know that this is percolated all the way up to our banner medical journal, the New England Journal of Medicine, with this commentary specifically highlighting about how um, maybe out-of-pocket costs should be treated as a side effect that we talk to our patients about, um, in that you would never start someone on a chemotherapy regimen without warning them of the risk of peripheral neuropathy or that they could lose their hair. Um, and yet we are routinely starting people on a cancer treatment course without talking to them about the potential risks to their finances and to their financial health. This is something that is translated over to the lay media as well as patients just get it. They understand that cancer care and other health care has become unaffordable and that they see in their own lives and the lives of their friends or their family that patients are having to make significant sacrifices and sometimes are just unable to afford the cancer care. And this is where I say, well, I do actually have a disclosure, not that I have made, you know, thousands of millions of dollars from financial toxicity, um, but that I have paid uh, a lot of money in financial toxicity. And in 2017, I shared my own story um, on NPR specifically about how when my husband was diagnosed with cancer, how we faced really excruciating costs related to his diagnosis and treatment, and that after he died, those costs really followed me for a decade and it set me on the path to become a physician and also set me on the path to do the work that I do today in financial toxicity and it's the reason why I'm so passionate about it. I actually have skin in the game as they say. Now Financial toxicity is really a new name for a growing problem, which is something that my mentor at Duke said, that's Dr. Yusuf Safar, when he was describing these rising burdens um, on patients um, in terms of their costs and their sacrifices. And when we talk about financial toxicity, I want to be clear. This is a patient-facing problem because unfortunately the term is sometimes misused to mean rising healthcare costs to the system or rising prices for insurance. And it's really a patient-facing problem. So uh, the NCI designates that financial toxicity are the problems that a patient has related to the cost of their Medicare, medical care. Um, and they specifically high that, highlight that people with cancer are more likely to have this problem. In my own words, what I say is that 
Even with health insurance, the high costs of cancer care are leaving some vulnerable American families adrift in debt. I know that personally, and that these out-of-pocket costs are having real effects on quality of life and quality of care. I always show this slide to level set to talk about what is what are these patient economic burdens that we're talking about. We're talking about billions of dollars every year. And those costs are reflected not just in the out-of-pocket expenses, the thing you need to take out of your wallet in order to afford your care, but also the time costs related to your diagnosis and treatment and survivorship care. Um, and what this study from Dr. Yalbroff shows quite elegantly is that not just that there is a disproportionate burden of costs um, uh, paid by the younger patients, but that also those costs are really durable over time. And you can be 10 years out from a cancer diagnosis and still be paying significantly in both out-of-pocket costs and in time costs. We know that financial toxicity matters to our patients. We have a lot of evidence that it decreases the quality of life for our patients. It decreases the satisfaction they have with their care. And ultimately it erodes the quality of care that they receive. So again, a lot of evidence pointing that when, when financial problems get high, quality of life goes down. We know that patients who have greater financial burdens are just more likely to have anxiety. They're more likely to have fatigue. They have higher symptom burdens. They have lower social functioning and they have lower physical functioning. And I always point to the diagram on the left as sort of like the unholy triangle of, of the coexisting conditions where financial distress is interrelated. It is sometimes hard to pick it out from quality of life, quality of care and advanced disease. Um, they are all interrelated. Uh, and they're all um, unfortunately feeding into each other. We know that satisfaction with care is eroded when financial burden increases, um, and that you know that burden decreases your sat satisfaction with general satisfaction, your satisfaction with financial aspects of care, um, but it actually erodes your satisfaction with the technical quality of care. And in this study, what we show is that those questions that are starting to, you know, get eroded in terms of, you know, your satisfaction are really kind of trust questions. The questions are, sometimes my doctor makes me wonder if my di if their diagnosis is correct, or I have some doubts about the ability of the doctors who treat me. So you can imagine as costs are rising and you know, quality of life is going down, satisfaction is going down and maybe trust is being eroded, that then starts affecting adherence. So again, you don't just, um, you can't afford your medication. Um, this is one of many, many studies showing that as costs rise, adherence goes down because quite frankly, you're not non-compliant, you just can't afford it. Um, our study showed that again, about a quarter of patients were non-adherent in some respect to their their planned medications, including one in five who didn't even fill a prescription related to the cost. And I think terrifyingly one in 20 who skipped took less or didn't fill their chemotherapy prescriptions. Um, so specifically doing things that could interfere with the efficacy of their cancer treatment. We know that financial toxicity matters because it increases things. So if it's decreasing quality of life satisfaction, it's increasing personal and family burdens. It's increasing the risk of bankruptcy and ultimately it's increasing the risk of mortality. So this is, again, one of many studies looking at personal family burden. And what we found in our research is that two thirds of patients were having to make some sort of sacrifice in order to afford their care, um, including about half who had used their savings and a quarter of patients who had borrowed money or literally gone into debt in order to afford cancer treatment. And again, some things to highlight here are that these are things that can affect the whole family. So not just the patient who is being treated, um, but their entire family unit. And you can see generational poverty related to a cancer diagnosis and extreme financial toxicity. We know that this burden increases over time. And so this study came out at the very end of 2021 showing that if you 
look at patients over time and you survey them every three months, you will see that their burden only increases. And um, by the end of a year, two, uh, sorry, three fourths of patients with uh, who are on active treatment had some major financial hardship. They had loans, they had debt, they had income decline, they had to refinance their home. And of course, that this was associated with decreased quality of life. We know that these can really affect your financial health. So you have mental health strain, you have physical health strain, you have cancer outcomes, but you can also damage your financial health. And so this study came out at the beginning of 2022, showing that there's you know, there's collections, there's tax liens, there's delinquent mortgage payments, there's foreclosures related to a cancer diagnosis. Um, and this was a really novel study looking at how you can essentially um, tie um, a cancer registry to, um, to credit um, reports and credit information. We know ultimately that some patients are having kind of the, the, the large, um, the, the worst financial outcome, which is bankruptcy after a cancer diagnosis, and that um, cancer is actually an independent risk factor for bankruptcy. So you're over two and a half times uh, more likely to declare bankruptcy in the context of a cancer diagnosis. Um, and we know this matters because ultimately, if you have that ultimate negative financial outcome related to costs, that you will have the ultimate you'll be more likely to have the ultimate negative health outcome, which is death. And so that people who have uh, bankruptcy in the context of a cancer diagnosis are quite frankly, just more likely to die. We know that healthcare disparities drive financial toxicity. And we know that the inverse is true too, that financial toxicity drives healthcare disparities. And they're basically just two sides of the same coin. Uh, when we think about financial toxicity, we do need to highlight that there's a disproportionate impact on communities of color or communities made more vulnerable um, through structural racism. Um, and this is just one of many studies showing that, for example, Black women with breast cancer are more likely to have adverse financial impacts from cancer. They're more likely to have health-related financial barriers, transportation barriers, and loss of health insurance, um, again, after breast cancer diagnosis. Process. In a national study of all comers, again, a larger study, um, we know that Black patients are five times more likely to be denied um, health insurance after a cancer diagnosis and more than twice as likely to report being hurt financially because of their cancer. So this burden does not fall proportionately on all of our patients. Um, I highlight this study specifically because I find the results are so shocking that um, one in 20 Black or Latinx women with an early stage of breast cancer actually became housing unstable related to the financial impact of their cancer treatment. Our cancer treatments are causing some people to be homeless. It is shocking and it shouldn't happen in, in this country of wealth and privilege. Um, but we know that there is ha haves and have nots always. Um, but I, I always try to focus again that we're, you know, when we're talking about financial toxicity, we, we, it can affect anyone, but it can certainly have disproportionate burden on certain populations. We know that this is actually causing a problems within our clinical trial enrollment, and that the people that we enroll in our clinical trials are not reflective of the people who actually have the disease in the United States, and that this financial burden related to, for example, participating in a clinical trial is an obstacle to enrollment. Um, cost and insurance concerns are consistently something that is cited as a barrier. Um, and we know that there are costs related to clinical trial participation, and some of them are not um, reimbursed, um, and that these are specific worries um, that can limit a diverse um, a diverse enrollment uh, within clinical trials, which then maybe means that the um, outcomes that are found are not reflective of the true benefit within a diverse population. We also know that, <laughs> of course, if there's anything that exposed the cracks in healthcare within the United States, the COVID pandemic did, and that whatever was happening before the pandemic has been made worse during COVID. 
Um, and so this study was specifically looking at AYA cancer survivors, so patients who are diagnosed and treated with cancer before the age of 40. Um, they are a vulnerable population. They all do have a lot of um, access and healthcare um, insurance and, um, and financial toxicity at baseline. And we know that it was made even worse during the pandemic. And so our study showed that they're basically two thirds um, of our surveyed patients had some negative financial, sorry, negative economic event as a, as a result of the pandemic, including one in five who had lost their jobs or furloughed, a similar amount who had decreased job security, one in five who couldn't pay rent or mortgage, that this was actually causing downstream effects in terms of their healthcare access and utilization. So patients were skipping out on mental health um, appointments. They were skipping out on preventative health care. And I think, unfortunately, we will reap the rewards of this um, decreased access to health care um, significantly into the future, unfortunately, in terms of increased risk um, for our survivors. I always hear this a lot, which is we know that costs are high, but we also have a lot of benefits within our healthcare system. We're at MSK, we're at Stanford, we're, we're in a very um, moneyed institution. We, we don't have those problems with our patients. Um, and I'll tell you that, yeah, it's our patients, um, even at, this is a study done at Memorial Sloan Kettering, um, even here, we are, our patients are having financial toxicity. And when we measured objective financial toxicity, meaning two or more bills sent to collections, being on a payment plan, having bankruptcy, needing financial assistance, having financial concerns documented by social work, we found that a quarter of our patients on active treatment in a modern cohort were having these concerns. We know that patients are having these problems primarily by being sent to collections, so something that can be actually kind of silent um, to the provider, um, and that unfortunately kind of the minority were hooked in with social work or through um, financial assistance programs, so maybe they were just essentially getting these bills in the mail, um, threatening letters, I'm very familiar with them, um, and that we actually didn't even know as their providers in terms of them having this problem. We know that financial toxicity is not equal um, for the patients in terms of um, you know, the patients who experience it, but also based on disease type. And there are certain diseases that are more likely um, to have a higher financial toxicity burden. And so, for example, um, lymphomas, uh, myelomas, um, cervical cancer, they're towards the higher end of the spectrum, um, but prostate cancer, urinary bladder cancer are towards the lower end of the spectrum. But I do highlight here that even for these patients who have quote unquote low risk, we're still talking about 20% of the population as having um, potential problems in terms of, again, objective problems. Again, diving again within our own data set to look who, who are having these problems and when. Um, we know that financial toxicity is not necessarily something that you walk in the door and say, I'm having these problems at diagnosis, that it takes a little bit of time for this to develop similar to any other toxicity of a cancer treatment or of a therapy. Um, and that um, it can take maybe a year or two before they're in collections, you know, needing philanthropic support, having other financial concerns can show up a little earlier, um, but that we have maybe some lead time in terms of thinking, is this maybe something that we could intervene on earlier and potentially prevent? When we did a specific deep dive into an organ site, so this is gynecological cancers, um, over 4,000 women with gynecological cancers. Um, what we found is that um, the minority of patients had any kind of documented social work financial concerns. So again, maybe we're missing them through the regular screening channels. Um, and that um, in addition to what's known that for example, uh, racial ethnic minorities are more likely to have a problem. The type of insurance you have, for example, self-pay are more likely to have a problem. That actually the volume of imaging studies and the number of outpatient visits are also correlated to objective financial toxicity. Um, so again, um, this is controlled for disease type and stage. Um, and it does point to maybe some potential solutions. Maybe we're actually part of the problem with our frequent um, tests and images. I spend the beginning of the talk talking about why financial toxicity is bad. Um, and I always try to spend the rest of the talk talking about how we can fix it. Um, 
I do highlight that we're all responsible for it. So I don't wanna say uh, as a radiation oncologist, I know that my treatments can be quite expensive for patients. Um, we know that surgery has a, you know, a burden. We know that chemotherapy has a burden. We know that diagnostic radiology um, can, can create costs for our patients and certainly inpatient stays. Um, and I don't think there's really anyone who can say, oh, I don't cause problems for my patients with our treatments and our tests. Um, and when we think about these burdens on our patients in terms of, for example, the durable burdens um, for survivals, sur sur survivors, we really think about, you know, this is driven by this ongoing need for treatment or surveillance. We know that there's potentially inadequate health insurance and that patients are suffering from job block, meaning that they can't um, take the best job for themselves because they're worried about losing their health insurance. We know that our treatment disrupts work, uh, which can affect the career path or sometimes can cause um, early retirement for our patients. We know that the chronic effects are causing debility, maybe requiring a caregiver, which then takes two people out of the workforce. Um, and that we know we're eroding people's savings, we're, you know, we're depleting their assets, um, and that these are all potential durable concerns after um, cancer treatment, but also, again, any potential chronic disease state. When we think about these solutions to this multifactorial problem, thankfully, there are many prongs of solution. There's really nesting frameworks of the way that we can think of making improvements along systemic, interpersonal, individual frameworks from policy to provider to patient. Um, and this really provides me some hope, which is a multifactorial problem will have many different solutions. Um, and that allows us to really think about um, so many different avenues um, to, to improve the status quo. Starting from the top, um, you know, there are policy guidelines to improve value affordability and continue to have innovation. Um, the President's Cancer Panel uh, met a couple of years ago specifically with this uh, focus and put together a, a really nice briefing on this. They met with patients, providers, pharmaceutical companies, researchers, really thought about kind of how to gather a broad set of stakeholders. Um, and put together some policy guidelines, which I would recommend that you read. In terms of actual concrete policy changes that could help improve affordability for our patients, um, we know that in January 2019, there was a price transparency ruling um, showing that hospitals had to publish their charge master lists. Um, and that, that was updated actually in 2021 to say, you know what, charge master lists are kind of useless. Um, we should actually require that hospitals publish their negotiated rates, which is actually a little bit more list, realistic in terms of um, how much money is going to be charged to insurances. Um, so those are you know, ways of improving price transparency, which could in theory improve um, the cost for patients um, downstream. Um, we know as part of the Build Back Better um, plan that there was um, certain provisions put in that could have greatly helped um, have patients afford their care, including allowing the federal government to negotiate prices for some high cost drugs and capping out of pocket spending for Medicare Part D. Of course, this did not advance, which is a true shame because I do feel like it would have helped. Um, we know that there are national policy initiatives. And I think, honestly, the easiest one to highlight is the Affordable Care Act. Um, what the Affordable Care Act did was that it um, uh, had certain provisions that directly benefited um, uh, patients specifically with cancer, but it, again, anyone with a chronic disease state. Um, so for example, eliminating lifetime caps um, that insurance would pay out, that is specifically what my husband ran into. And after a certain dollar amount, his insurance was essentially useless. Um, it did not obviously um, allow uh, coverage denials um, for pre-existing conditions um, and didn't uh, disallows people from being charged more based on, for example, their gender um, or their prior um, uh, disease history. Um, and it requires essential health benefits be covered, including cancer treatment and follow-up. Um, you know, this National Healthcare Initiative specifically did help patients who are at the highest risk for healthcare disparities. As you can see on these graphs, um, uh, the patients who had the most benefit from Medicaid expansion were actually those who were low income. I think you can also see based on these graphs that quite frankly, there was already kind of a haves and have nots in terms of health insurance anyway, based on state distribution. Um, but that 
people with a newly diagnosed cancer were just less likely to be uninsured um, for states that expanded Medicaid. Um, we know that price transparency, although it can help, it hasn't really helped people yet. Um, what our own research shows is that compliance for these rules is quite poor, um, even at our leading cancer centers, um, like NCI designated cancer centers. Um, and of, of our evaluated um, study, um, only 21% had a complete machine readable file as, re as required. Um, but that for those who actually had um, costs listed, it was incredibly variable based on essentially between centers or between insurance types um, for a single fraction of radiation, you could pay $300 or you could pay $33,000. And so there does appear to be a disconnect of the price with the actual value of the treatment because I do not think that the $33,000 radiation treatment was that much better than the $300 one. I am not a shelf for the Affordable Care Act. I do think it has a lot of flaws and, and for many people it is not actually affordable. Um, and specifically in terms of one of the limitations of the Affordable Care Act is that there are limited networks. Um, and so this study showed that although the majority of um, exchange plans did have access to a commission on cancer site, the minority, less than 50%, had access to an NCI cancer center. So again, if you have a rare cancer, if you have aggressive cancer, if you're young, you may want specialty care and you may not be able to get it within network. We also know that unfortunately healthcare policy um, and, um, and politics are feeding into each other. And that uh, with the um, 2016 elections, um, there was progressive erosion of the ACA policies and aligned with those erosions of policies was the loss of insurance for cancer patients and survivors. And so our study shows that about 200,000 patients lost health insurance um, after the NADER, um, um, uh, which was preceding the November 2016 elections. We know that there is a role for national advocacy um, for um, improving affordability, um, improving access. And so ASCO again is the American Society for Clinical Oncology. Um, and they had a big win a couple of years ago specifically supporting the Clinical Trial um, Access Act. So the uh, Previously, Medicaid did not need to cover clinical trial access, and so you could get newly acquired health insurance through the Affordable Care Act, but still not have access to a clinical trial that may be your best option. Um, and this actually changed. So the Clinical Treatment Act was passed, and uh, this has changed um, our for access to clinical trials for people on Medicaid, which was a huge win. Of course, the next step, there's always something next is the Diverse Trials Act. And so this is an active bill. It is a bipartisan, bicameral legislation. Um, and it would encourage, um, so it would allow trial sponsors, I'm sorry, to reimburse patients for non-medical costs, um, including, for example, travel, parking, lodging. So the distinct barriers that actually stop some people from um, participating in trials, it would allow sponsors to provide patients with technology so that they can do remote participation. Um, and it would... Um, uh, require um, uh, the uh, HHS to create guidance for decentralized trials that could then increase trial diversity. So again, one more role for national advocacy in terms of improving access and affordability. There are national uh, healthcare initiatives like the Choosing Wisely campaign. So there are Choosing Wisely guidelines for basically every um, um, major society now, but again, within Cancer Care, ASCO, ASTRO, and SSO, the Society for Surgical Oncologies do have Choosing Wisely guidelines, um, and these are opportunities to improve the quality and value of cancer care and to potentially avoid doing costly studies and tests that provide no measurable evidence-based benefit for our patients. Within ourselves, within healthcare research and academic research, we can do escalate de-escalation research. So we can fund and promote studies and enroll people on studies that maybe do less with more, or sorry, more with less. Um, 
So fast forward was a trial published um, actually right on time during COVID showing that one week of radiation may be just as good as three weeks for um, women with breast cancer. Um, and there's some evidence that, for example, an expensive medication like abiraterone for men with castrate resistant prostate cancer can be used at a lower dose so that maybe we could save money by actually prescribing less pills um, for an expensive medication and get the same benefit. We can do things like true comparative effectiveness research. So not a model of costs, but actually see if we have an expensive treatment modality that's newer, is it truly better? And I think this is the lovely thing about American healthcare system is that we're constantly, you know, making improvements um, that we're confident are going to benefit patients. And so, for example, um, the Ramirez trial was published in the New England Journal of Medicine a couple of years ago, um, specifically looking at minimum invasive surgery for cervical cancer, because minimally invasive surgery had rapidly proliferated. Um, and it does potentially improve recovery, decrease hospital length of stay. But in reality, uh, this trial showed that it was actually worse in terms of cancer outcomes and that women were more likely to die from cervical cancer if they had this type of surgery, which was more expensive. <laughs> Um, within my own field, again, radiation, we need to do trials that if, for example, we are going to use something expensive like proton beam therapy, that it's actually worth it in terms of either disease control or decreased long-term side effects or quality of life for our patients. And so when we use this expensive treatment modality, we should be doing it within the context of a clinical trial, unless there's level one evidence that it's truly benefiting our patients. We can think about affordability frameworks of how to essentially put things into a big picture context on the healthcare system um, and to make sure that we're addressing all these aspects of patient affordability. I am a member of the cost of care group, um, which is a, a group of clinicians who are focused on affordability. Um, and it, we have put together some frameworks to think about, okay, like how do we um, create meaningful, actionable, um, you know, payment transparency? How do we train clinicians better? How do we develop uh, financial pathways um, that address affordability? And how do we make sure that we're providing high value, um, you know, uh, high quality care? Um, and again, sort of thought visions to think about how to improve care. Um, we can actually do research specifically at the low hanging fruit. And so I highlight this specific research, which was presented about a month and a half ago, um, which looked at how this particular drug for endometrial cancer had this unique packaging, which was causing significant medical waste. So the estimated waste was over $160 million. Um, based on the fact that so many patients needed a dose reduction. And so again, with these blister packs, um, it kind of locks you into the pills that you have. Um, and what this presentation did in real time, as my colleague, Dr. Vicki, um, was about to go on stage to present it, the pharmaceutical company came up to her and made a promise to actually create and promote an unrestricted pill exchange program. So this uh, research led to an immediate change in terms of benefiting patients and improving affordability for them. What I've highlighted so far has been upper level manufacturers, Affordable Care Act, choosing wisely. I wanna spend the remaining time I have just focusing on the provider and patient level, because again, I feel it is no less meaningful and potentially is the thing that is actually gonna help the patient that is in front of you later today or tomorrow. I do think of this on a public health framework in terms of how do we prevent financial toxicity from forming how do we reduce the impact um, by detecting it early? Or how do we soften the impact um, of ongoing disease so that it has less lasting effects? So primary prevention, how do we prevent financial toxicity from forming? We know that education is important on both sides from both patient to provider. And even just listening to me talk today, I feel like I, I hope sparks um, something in you to further these conversations. Um, we know that um, for patients, we, there's a real role for financial navigators to optimize their health insurance. Um, and that, that is actually some low laying fruit that has a lot of potential to save both providers and also healthcare systems money. 
We know that we can do better in terms of optimizing their uh, financial assistance, being more proactive versus reactive when people are not able to afford their medications. And we know that improving access um, is important because if people are able to, for example, maintain their work, if they're able to have appointments that work for their schedules, um, they will not just have income coming in from work, but they will actually be able to maintain their employer-sponsored health insurance, which may be the thing that supports their health insurance, but also the health insurance for their entire family. We know that on the provider level, there's value-based care. Um, it is something that we should be striving for every single day. We should be striving to eliminate low value care via cost-aware prescribing patterns. We should be streamlining our clinics and providing telehealth as able. Um, and we should be advocating, advocating at our own, our, our own centers to, for practical solutions for financial toxicity. So we know financial counseling can definitely help patients. Uh, oddly, the thing about financial counseling that is hilarious is that it doesn't actually lower costs, right? And it's just letting people be more aware of their costs. And again, the vast majority of people say that it helps. It helps them understand their costs better. It helps them understand their health insurance better. We know that medical education does not routinely um, teach about value and costs or affordability, and that's a real deficit. So we could be doing better for our um, trainees um, and then down the line for our patients by improving medical education about value. And I highlight the Dell Medical School um, modules specifically, which are available for free online for anyone to take um, as um, courses that you could take on your own time to think about how do we improve value-based healthcare? Um, how do we improve value at the bedside? The ASCO value framework was put together with this idea that we could facilitate discussions between providers and patients on the value of treatment options. Um, this is the idea that if there is no actual clinical difference benefit between two treatments, but one is more expensive, that we should probably just be choosing the cheaper one, again, because there's no difference. Um, but that when there is a difference noted, that's when it may be worth it. Again, pretty common sense things. I think you know the flaw with the value framework is always that a lot of providers just have no idea how much things cost, um, nor is there an easy way for us to find out how. We know that there are simple practical solutions to improve affordability. And so our own survey um, of our patients said, you know what, one of the things you could do is just make me late, wait less. If I wasn't in the waiting room for two hours, I could come in and see out, come out, I'll see you really quickly, I'll go back to work, I'll only have to lose half of a day of work instead of the whole day. Um, and that can make a difference for some patients. We know that parking can be a big difference for our patients. It can be a huge expense in terms of when you have um, a daily fee for someone on treatment, it can be a huge burden. We know that there's some potential technological solutions. So financial navigation can actually occur through an app. And what this study showed is that actually for patients who had um, been randomized to receive this um, financial assistant app, that it actually improved their rate of both applying for and receiving financial assistance. So about a third of patients applied for and received financial assistance. Um, so that's really promising. And then we know, of course, of course, telemedicine lowers costs, right? <laughs> that, that just makes sense. Um, so our own study showed that about two thirds of patients said that, yeah, it was better for than an office visit in terms of treatment related costs. So travel, time off of work, et cetera. We can think about um, prevention at the um, at cancer center level. So a financial toxicity tumor board means gathering all to get the, together the people who are most passionate and interested in improving affordability for our patients, and then uh, tackling the most common problems. Um, for example, you know, co coding or billing problems, pre-certification, you know, in uninsured or underinsured patients, um, and that for for a dedicated team of people, they can really help thousands of patients and save millions of dollars. Um, for patients. For people who, um, for when we want to actually um, reduce the impact by diagnosing financial toxicity early, there are simple screening tests that you can do. One of them is just the NCCN problem list. So it's a yes, no. Essentially, are you having problems with insurances or finances? So it can be a very simple, straightforward screening. I do encourage you to do it often and early because we know that it's not necessarily something that um, someone will have when they come in the door for their first consult. There is a validated screening measure for financial toxicity, which is called the cost score. It is available for free. It's um, 
a Likert scale series of questions. It takes about five minutes for patients to complete. Um, and it does measure both objective and subjective financial distress. We know that if you do screen, that providers could potentially respond. They're willing to respond. So this is our study that just came out in GEMMA Network Open, showing that providers in general do feel that they should be aware of someone's financial risk, that they feel that they have a role in minimizing financial toxicity, and that potentially guidelines should actually incorporate affordability. Um, when we think about um, national guidelines um, for the, the standard of care. Um, unfortunately, what we found is that sadly people aren't really trained to do this, right? So very few had received any training on cost affordability um, and very few people had had any training on cost conversations. Um, and yet that physicians felt that, yeah, maybe part of what we're doing is prescribing more expensive drugs when there's less expensive alternatives. Um, this led to one of our pilots here at MSK, which is to empower the clinical team. And again, this is a pretty straightforward idea, but previously when people had a financial problem, if we were even to have identified it, we would send them to social work. Everyone went to social work. That was overburdening our social work team. Um, and so what we found is that we needed to bulk up our patient financial services group um, because there was really no listed reason with, within a social work context about someone having a financial issue. And so what we did with our financial toxicity order set is that we actually um, empowered our providers to actually identify problems um, and that anyone can put in this order that refers people directly to financial assistance, specifically with the reason and the barrier that they're facing, including, for example, high costs, um, out-of-network insurance, et cetera. And we're studying this. We're trying to make sure that the, you know, when we actually do um, an order set that it's being used and that it's actually ultimately helping patients. And so this is actually going to be presented um, at ASCO um, this, um, this June, actually in a month. Our goal is ultimately we want to um, enable financial toxicity screening universally. So we want to screen every single person. We want to do it in a way that patient friendly. We want it to have a clear output for the clinical team. And we want to make sure that we're screening people appropriately. Again, you know, maybe every three months, maybe twice a year, depending on the type of disease and the disease status. We're screening people with the cost score, again, that validated measure. We're also screening people with some challenge questions, which are including sacrifice questions, um, savings, loans, taking less medication, but also some question, uh, one question at least that, that is more of a social determinants of health question. If you have enough money in a typical month to meet food, housing, clothing, medicine, repairs to home and transportation needs. As part of our screening, we're all also obviously collecting quality of life data. Rounding out, how do we soften the impact of financial toxicity before it causes lasting effects or affects disease outcomes? And honestly, I think the simplest thing is to just encourage cost conversations because what we know is that the vast majority of patients do want to have a conversation about their costs. But I think sadly, the minority have it with their doctor. And I think maybe even more terrifyingly, less than a third talk to anyone in the healthcare system about their costs, not a social worker, not the front desk person taking their copay, not the person who's sending them their um, to bill collections. Mm -hmm. And we know cost conversations matter because they can help. They don't help every single person. They don't lower costs to zero, but they can help in meaningful ways. And again, I can speak to this personally. <laughs> a meaningful difference is not eliminating cost. It can be just a parking voucher. So we know that cost conversations can help primarily by referring to financial assistance. So essentially a program that already exists that could that they potentially already qualified for, but that they weren't getting connected to. We know that sometimes um, physicians need to require or need to appeal to insurance. We know sometimes you need to switch uh, to a less expensive medication. All of these things are certain true. But I always try to highlight that most of these benefits in terms of costs were without changing anything involving uh, an actual cancer treatment. So not quote unquote compromising their cancer care. Um, so again, at the provider to patient level, I always try to highlight that, you know, there's education. We need to think about financial navigation and value-based care. We need to obviously practice high value care and eliminate low value care. 
Um, we're hoping to diagnose financial toxicity early by screening so that it can be intervened upon early. And that, you know, ultimately, if we normalize cost conversations and we refer to assistance when appropriate, um, we're helping to prevent a downstream effect of, for example, someone not showing up for their treatment. Ultimately, we know that mitigating financial toxicity is possible, but it's a real problem because it's growing in the United States and ultimately cancer outcomes are at risk. I try to say, you know, we spend a lot of time at the bottom of the triangle in terms of treating disease and we need to spend a lot more time at the, at the top. So we need to flip the triangle in terms of if we do more work, put more effort, put more money and funding into preventing financial toxicity that will ultimately serve our patients the best. And there is a false dichotomy in the United States that it's your money or your life that you have to choose between bankruptcy or death and certainly no less within a cancer diagnosis. I think sadly, I know from my own personal experience, you can lose both. You can die and also spend thousands of dollars. And that leaves your family both emotionally and financially devastated. I'm really passionate about this work on financial toxicity. And I'm just so grateful to talk to you today about why it's important for ourselves and for our patients. So thank you so much. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Chino. That was amazing. Um, you have done so much work in this area and, and put together so much data for us to tr really try to understand this issue. Um, there are tons of questions in the Q&A. Uh, we'll, we'll see what we can get through in, in the nine minutes that we have left. There are a couple of questions about um, how much of this is a US problem? And is it because of the way our healthcare system is structured? Do, do we see this amount of, or do people see this amount of toxicity in say the NHS or in Canada um, in single payer type systems? That is a really good question. It's a very common question. So I would say certainly um, this problem is worse within the United States um, and that's no lie. However, financial toxicity does exist in, in uh, countries that have nationalized health care, that have single payer. Um, most of those um, financial toxicity questions or problems are driven by either travel or lost wages. Um, and this is where, again, the US fails um, its citizens by, for example, not having um, a required paid sick leave. Um, in Germany, you actually get paid 70% of your salary for, I believe, 78 weeks, so a year and a half with a serious diagnosis. Um, and obviously that takes a lot of pressure off in terms of, you know, surviving treatment um, and, rec and into recovery. Um, so I do think that different healthcare systems do better or worse, but it doesn't eliminate financial toxicity um, in a single payer system. I think, again, it, it, it would be better. <laughs> um, so, um, but it, it still exists, sadly. Um, thank you. That that makes a lot of sense. It's still kind of going to be a problematic problematic because there's no <laughs> great solution all around. It seems there's so many different levels at which this has to be addressed. Um, another question um, that has come up and that I thought of as well is around um, kind of around value. Like, how do we know when some of these very expensive treatments um, are being used, especially those that are more experimental? Um, and sometimes, I mean, we know for, for, especially for cancer patients, sometimes people will, will try anything. Um, and by people, I mean, both the patients and, and, and physicians and the healthcare team. So how much of the cost is being driven by things that aren't necessarily adding value? Or do you have a sense of that compared to, you know, what is truly um, helping people and improving their, their health outcomes? Yeah, so we certainly have a real problem of, um, Overutilization at the end of life, specifically with all disease types in the United States, but specifically within cancer. And we know that the bulk of costs um, for someone with cancer are within the last six months of their life. And a lot of it is futile care. Um, so my husband died in the hospital and he died while on fourth line chemotherapy. And the chance that that fourth line chemotherapy was going to do even a single percentage benefit for him was very, very low. Um, and again, I know that desperation. I have felt it myself. I have been the person calling to try to get someone on a clinical trial, um, even though I know that it's probably of little efficacy for them and will have come at incredible costs, um, because that is um, 
I, I feel that personally. Um, I would say that we don't, one, the rules in the United States are that if there is an FDA approval for a cancer drug, that the insurance company needs to pay for it. Doesn't matter if it's better, doesn't matter if the benefit is uh, two weeks. Um, and the cost of the drug is $100,000 per infusion. Um, and so we are not very good at value in the United States, but also we haven't figured out what value even means, right? And this is the problem when we throw around these terms like affordability and value is that we haven't even really just we haven't really defined what we're considering value. So classically costs divided by quality, but whose costs and what quality and what, we're, what outcomes are we even measuring? And when we think about even, for example, designing clinical trials, very few clinical trials have been designed to a patient reported outcome endpoint or a financial toxicity endpoint. Um, and I, you know, our last study showed that it was something less than 1%. Um, and so we're not even measuring those things. When we do the work, the preliminary work that gets the drugs approved, we're not considering that at all. And I think that really needs to change. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think that's a great point about how we truly define and measure value. Um, there's a question here about any, um, the question is, are there any studies of cross-generational effects of financial toxicity, um, effects on the next generation in terms of education or intergenerational wealth transfer or anything like that? So, in general, when we think about this research involving financial toxicity it is primarily rooted in cancer. It's primarily rooted in the US and these are real flaws, obviously with the research. I think it's building in other countries and it's building within other organ sites and it's building longitudinally, right? Because uh, a lot of the data captures the central, the cost you have now, or maybe the downstream effects. But when I say that financial toxicity can cause generational poverty, sadly, it's not based on good evidence, like a reported study, but because I can, I've seen it happen. Um, and so I think, you know, we do need to do more research on that, right? We need to know what, how the effects of, for example, compromised education for a patient then affected their career growth, that then affected the their their kids growth. I can again speak to my own personal experience in terms of, you know, when my husband was diagnosed with cancer that ultimately took me out of the workforce for about a decade. Um, and so there are real longitudinal harms on both the patient if they survive and also the family members. Um, and if you think about again the study I quoted about, for example, becoming homeless related to your cancer treatment, that certainly has effects on not just the index patient, but also their whole family. Um, so we need to do better work. It's true. I, I think, you know, I think it's clear what we're going to find, um, which is quite frankly, very, very depressing. Yeah, I know that sounds uh, exactly right in terms of putting together the data that you shared and also the, the personal experiences that you've had that it, there's, there's no way this doesn't have a, a, an impact on the next generation. Um, there's a question about um, the training of doctors to understand um, how these uh, or what type of financial questions we should ask to pre-assess uh, for financial toxicity for patients. I know you mentioned some modules from Dell around value-based care. Are, are there um, formal training programs or is that, is that the only one or, you know, what, what kind of training is available for physicians and other members of the healthcare team who, who place orders and, and kind of direct treatment plans to help us understand our role and also what the implications are and how we can best support our patients? So I think, unfortunately, it's sort of a, you know, institution by institution within each institution. Some people have developed their own curriculum. Um, I know, for example, Harvard has a class um, about value care and the students actually run in the hospital and they actually create price lists for each, you know, your daily labs cost this much. And, you know, they actually have a conversation in terms of you're in the ICU, does that chest x-ray really matter? Um, and this is what the cost is. And so there are some, um, obviously some institutions that have invested a lot of time and effort into developing curriculums. Um, Dell is the one I pointed out because it's the one that I've seen that has made their, their curriculum um, available for free and for, for the public. Um, and again, it's built out of the cost of care modules. Um, uh, uh, I think, you know, in reality, there's not a standardized way of teaching this. And there's no, um, in my own um, analysis of looking at um, the curriculum of, of medical schools, it's all over the map in terms of if you spend 
um, one slide on value versus if you spent if there's a whole class on it. And so um, affordability, value, cost conversations, these are all things that in theory we should be teaching the next generation. And I think it's very piecemeal in terms of what you actually absorb. And if you had a family medicine doctor who taught you about the $4 medicine list, then you know it. But if you didn't, um, then you have no idea that Walmart offers um, Coumadin for you know $4 and then that could save your patient a lot of money. And that maybe this antibiotic, which is on the $4 list and this antibiotic could have a difference of $1,000. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And it seems like maybe there's an opportunity here for at the kind of the LCME level of, of requiring some education around financial toxicity for our patients. Uh, related to that, I just have a question about EHR and like when there are notifications for how much things cost. Um, does has there have there been studies on that related to cancer and financial toxicity and whether that has made any difference? So in general, we know that the nudges do tend to help. Um, for example, there's evidence that it helps with referrals to palliative care. It, it, there's evidence that it can help, for example, nudge people into using biosimilars and, and you know, a cheaper, medic essentially, version of the same medication. Um, it, there's, there's evidence that it, if it shows the tier of the pharmacy benefit for a patient, that it can help you kind of steer you towards the potentially more affordable treatment. I think we're in a world now where we have a lot of nudges um, <laughs> um, and we're over it, we're inundated uh, with nudges within the EMR system. And the, you know, part of using healthcare technology, for example, like apps or things are embedded into, into, the, into the electronic medical system is to try to use them wisely to think about what is the best optimal way of providing um, real-time data in terms of um, this is actually what your out-of-pocket cost is for this medication um, versus an alternative medication. And that's, I think, where we're heading. Um, I just don't think we're, we're there quite yet. Um, and again, I'm getting nudged to death myself, so I get it. Yeah, I mean, I do think that's, and I, I, we're going to, if it's okay, I'm just going to go over like another minute, um, just because there, there's so much um, really important content that you're sharing with us. Um, but yeah, there's so much coming at us all the time. It's hard to know how much would change if I knew, you know, the, it, like you said, if there's a big gap between this medication and another one, then maybe it'll affect practice. But if it's not a big gap and they're both super expensive, you know, most people I think would just go ahead and order whichever one they wanted and, and not pause and think, do we really need um, this treatment at all? Okay, I was just gonna ask one more question and then we'll stop. Um, this question is about um, the, the healthcare system that we have here in the US and the way that we practice that may result in a lot of unnecessary testing and treatments. How much, this person says, how much of the problem is that modern healthcare is inherently expensive to provide in the way that we provide it? And, and how much toxicity would remain if we had comprehensive um, insurance for our patients and could reduce that unnecessary testing and treatment? Yeah, I think that there's, you know, there's been studies that show that something like 30% of healthcare is unnecessary or is essentially over treatment. I think within cancer care, it's quite variable. We're certainly diagnosing and treating cancers um, uh, that will probably never affect someone's life lifespan, like, for example, early stage thyroid cancer, DCIS, um, low risk prostate cancer, um, those sort of things. Um, and I think, you know, in terms of when we think about the low hanging fruit, um, for US healthcare, how to redesign something like bundled payments and eliminating the fee for service, where I literally, as a radiation oncologist, get paid more to treat more. So it is an artificial disincentive for me to adopt the fast forward, which is one week of treatment, over three weeks of treatment versus over six weeks of treatment. If I treat them more, I will get paid more. And it's not to say that everyone is a greedy, greedy person, but they're, they've built their practice around a certain revenue stream. And when that revenue stream gets altered, that potentially practices will close. The idea of transitioning from fee-for-service to bundled payments. And so one of, again, I'm a radiation oncologist, so I'll mention the ROA PM. This idea that we could be rewarding high value care is incredibly attractive. And I think the concept of, for example, the ROAPM is incredible, right? Which is, you know, improve value in healthcare, lower cost, you know, win, win, win. I think, unfortunately, as these plans are designed, um, again, I'm not going to pick on the ROAPM that much, but it could actually worsen healthcare disparities in terms of um, the patients who have higher needs um, are also the ones who are 
had been historically and presently disenfranchised from health care. Um, and then, pay, then the providers who actually take care of those needs, which come at higher costs, are then punished for taking care of those patients. So without appropriate compensation for higher need, higher risk patients, we're really leaving a lot of our provider teams out in the dark. Um, so I do think that there's a balance. I do think we can move forward. It just, we need kind of all hands on deck and we need input from the people who are literally like boots on the ground providing care. Um, and I don't think that that has been sadly manifest um, yet. And, and as you may or may not know, the ROIPM was actually put on essentially semi-permanent hold, indefinite hold um, for a redesign. Um, but I think we can redesign healthcare without burning it down, which actually is my preference. Um, but I'm not holding my breath for it. I do think we can redesign healthcare. I do think it could be more efficient. And I think that that will save money for our patients. Thank you so much. That was that was a very thorough answer and, and you covered so much ground as you have the entire hour and, and thank you for staying a few minutes late. Um, and thank you all for, for staying with us. Um, I, I want to leave us with a, a, one thought from Dr. Garcia, which is, you know, a lot of the solutions we've talked about are patchwork of individual individual actions as opposed to systemic solutions, which I know you talked about earlier in your talk. Um, and just a reminder for all of us that we we do need to push at all levels, right? Not not just on this, but every issue that we talk about here in our medical grand rounds. That individual action is important, but it's not going to solve all the problems. So we really need to be thinking each of us about how we push for change at the upper levels. Um, so with that, thank you so much, um, Dr. Chino, for spending your time with us this morning and sharing your expertise. And thank you all for being here. And I hope everyone has a lovely day. See you next time. <laughs>